So, we come now to the next step. And that step concerns now the question that I already mentioned uh, a few weeks ago. That is the question of the relationship between these philosophies of science that I discussed, discussed formally, namely inductivism and deductivism, which are normative philosophies of science, as I told you. They set up norms how good science should be practiced. In contrast, paradigm theory, as I announced earlier, pa paradigm theory is a descriptive philosophy of science. It presents a generalized description of how science develops. And the point is now, the, the, the problem is now, what do we do with the tension between a normative philosophy of science, like deductivism, and a descriptive philosophy of science, like paradigm theory, and let us see where such tension arises. And the most important tension between the normative philosophies of science, inductivism and deductivism, and the descriptive paradigm theory concerns normal science. Right? In, normal, in, in paradigm theory, normal science is a very important part of science. You, know, you stick to a paradigm, uh, you have your paradigmatic solutions, and you model your scientific practice after these um, paradigmatic solutions. And the tension is this, that from the point of view of the normative philosophies, normal science is a bad practice of science because of its quasi-dogmatic element. You know, the quasi-dogmatic element, I told you, is that, that you have a practice of science like puzzle solving in which you do not question the basic rules of normal science. Right? This is the point. You do not question them at all. Um, they are not tested. You, you are simply applying them. And if you look at that, especially from the point of view of um, deductivism, then this is just bad science because you are not testing these rules. And what, bad, what, what uh, um, deductivism tells you is that you are not allowed to use something which you have not continuously, or which you are not continuously testing, because you must always devise more and more tests in order to possibly falsify them. And you don't do that in normal science. And that's why I also use the term quasi-dogmatic, because the quasi-dogmatic highlights this difference to uh, what deductivism says. So from the point of view of deductivism, normal science is a bad practice. Right? It's not a good practice. Now, the question is what to do. Wow, okay. Now, here is the question that arises, namely whether the normative philosophies are right, in which case most of modern science is indeed bad science, or whether the normative philosophies are wrong in that respect, in which case normative science is a good scientific practice. Well, both uh, could be wrong. Both the philosophies could be wrong and it could be a bad practice. But let's not assume this worst case, right? So, um, I guess the bottom of your heart will say, of course, science is right and the philosophers are crazy, F but that's not an argument, right, from the bottom of your heart. It's not an argument. Let's look whether we find an argument, right? Okay, so we have here a situation that is exactly the sort of situation that I uh, talked about earlier, not today, but some weeks ago, when you have a norm and you have a certain practice and you have a disagreement between the norm and the practice. It's not clear what is wrong. The norm could be idiotic or the practice could be bad, right? Or both things could be bad. I, I, I exemplified that if you had a speed limit in Hanover of five kilometers per hour for every car, five kilometers per hour, and everyone would, would go 13, say, or 15, right? Then, of course, it would be in disagreement with the norm. But everyone would say, well, this norm is idiotic. You know, five kilometers per hour for cars in a city, it's idiotic. It doesn't make sense. So the norm is bad. But if you have a, a speed limit, say, of 50, as we have in Hanover, and some people go 60 or 70, then people would say those who do 70 kilometers an hour are wrong. They're making a mistake. It's bad to drive that fast. It's too dangerous in a city. You know, there are pedestrians, and we have this rule of 50, and it's a good rule. Right? So it's always the question when you have a difference a tension between norms and the practice <coughs> that it is not clear what is wrong, right? It could be the norms, it could be the practice. 
That's our situation here. I know that from the bottom of your hearts you say the scientists are right. If, if there's a tension between scientists and philosophers, it's clear that the philosophers are wrong, the scientists are right. Why? Because I'm a scientist. That's of course not a particularly good argument. <laughs> but I, I know that. But let's, let's uh, go about that a little more carefully. Now, paradigm theory defends the practice of normal science. Paradigm say, theory says yes. Normal science is a good scientific practice and paradigm theory says I can show why, why normal science is a good scientific practice and why the normative philosophies of science are wrong. Right? So they give an argument, the paradigm theory gives an argument, not just a gut feeling that you say I know who's right, it's me. Okay? So, and it does it in the following way. It's, Paradigm theory defends the practice of normal science by showing that this practice serves vital functions for the goal of science. Right? What is the goal of science? Well, the goal of science is, abstractly speaking, fairly simple. It's knowledge production. Science must produce scientific knowledge. That's its whole aim of that. Right? Like uh, uh, the industry, say, the, uh, the uh, plant industry is supposed to produce good plants. Right? And science is supposed to produce good scientific knowledge. So, paradigm theory defends the practice of normal science and says, look, normal science serves the, old, the, the goal of science, namely it produces uh, wonderful knowledge, and that normal science is a reasonable scientific practice, and consequently that the normative philosophies of science are wrong in this respect. Right? So, that's the strategy that um, a paradigm theory develops. It says normal science serves vital functions. It's a reasonable scientific practice. It's good that the way they do it. And consequently, that the normative philosophies of science that say that normal science is bad must be wrong. What? That's the, the, the strategy. And here is how it works. The argument runs as follows. This is just the structure of the argument. Right? It doesn't fill in the details, and I'm filling in now the details. You know, the, 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 the um, deductivism says, well, no, normal science is bad, it's quasi-dogmatic, it doesn't continue testing. So uh, because it doesn't continue testing, we say it's a bad science, a bad form of science. And paradigm theory said, look, no, look a little closer. Look what, is the what are the achievements of normal science. It serves vital functions for the goal of science. It's a reasonable practice. Uh, and therefore, uh, the normative philosophies are wrong, and the argument runs like that. And uh, that is probably no surprise for you, because I already hinted at the problems uh, that uh, the normative philosophies of science run into it, namely this question, what was missing in, the, in deductivism especially, namely a principle for the temporary acceptance of certain theories. I said that, that uh, deductivism is self-destroying, in effect, because it has no way of stopping testing, and the testing is infinite, right? There's no way of stopping that. And once you describe paradigm theory now in a way that you see that it provides this, this criterion when you are allowed to stop testing, then you understand why it's a reasonable practice, because you need that, right? The quasi-dogmatic element provides the principle which was missing, especially in deductivism, a principle for the perhaps only temporary acceptance of hypotheses that allow for temporarily halting tests. Right? That is what normal science license you. It says, once you have reached the stage of normal science, then you are allowed to stop testing. And it's reasonable to do so. Why? Because once you encounter difficulties with your normal science with your theory, they are not immediately taken as indicators of its failure in principle, but exposing the incapability of the respective scientists. That's what I told you once you have, normal, once you have anomalies in normal science, which happen all the time, a problem you couldn't solve, then it wasn't immediately channeled towards the guiding theory that you say, oh, the theory is, is a disaster. But you rather say, oh, this scientist is a disaster. He or she cannot solve the problem. It's not a problem of that theory. Now, why is this, uh, is this uh, good? Well, 
If you give up a theory because of one problem you cannot solve, you never find out what the real potential of the theory is. Right? If you look at Darwinism, and in Darwinism, when in back in 1871, I think it was, when Darwin discovered this problem of the sex ratio, right? the one-to-one -one ratio between the sexes in biological species. And Darwin said, I cannot solve the problem. Right? I don't know how to solve the problem. According to deductivism, people should have given up Darwinism. Right? It was a falsification of Darwinism. Right? People should have given it up. And then Darwinism would have been thrown away and people have, would have started anew. Now the point is that with the sex ratios, um, I looked that up in the meantime, that the first uh, serious work on sex ratios was then done in the 1930s, 50, 60 years later. Right? People knew there was a problem, they, did, they knew they could can't solve it, but they didn't give up Darwinism, which was absolutely right that they didn't give up Darwinism, because it is a problem that wasn't solvable at that time, but it was solvable later. And people, again, you see here, had the right judgment. It's a question of judgment. You look at the problem of the sex ratio, you look at, the prob you look at Darwinian theory, you look at what Darwinian theory is able to solve, and then you say, well, sooner or later we will probably solve the problem of the sex ratio. Right? That's the same way coming back here. You have this left, 42 arc seconds per century. You have solved 93%. Uh, uh, and then you say, reasonably, we will come back to that and sooner or later we will solve it. Right? In this particular case, the judgment was wrong, they, but it was a good judgment. It was, happens to be wrong. In the case of uh, Darwin, you had this anomaly. People also said, this is not a catastrophe. We will solve it sooner or later. And it took then 60 or even 80 years until it was really solved. So you see that it is reasonable not to give up a theory immediately once you encounter difficulties. You, it, it's just, you know, it's a question of time. You, you, you have to find your way. There are no really hard arguments, right? If someone had said in, in um, 1870, okay, I don't believe in Darwinism at all because it uh, doesn't give the, the right sex ratios, I, I do something else, well, fine, this, people would have, this person would have ruined his life as a scientist. He or she would have done something else. You know, nobody would have taken um, attention. He, he or she would have done whatever it is. But outside of the Darwinian paradigm, people would have said, what do you do? I'm not interested. Right? And if that person had instead worked on another problem within the Darwinian tradition, she or he would have become perhaps a famous scientist doing good work, interesting work. So it's a question of judgment. It's quite delicate. Science is quite a, there can be a quite delicate thing, especially when you... When you um, uh, encounter anomalies. And in that particular case, uh, it is useful not to take something like that or the sex ratio as a falsifying instance, as something which shows that your theory is false and give up the theory. Because then you can never find out what the real potential of the theory is. And that's a very, very strong argument for which you have thousands of examples in the history of science. You must find out how good a theory is because the really good theories that were invented in the history of science like classical physics or Darwinian theory or the theory of chemical bonds or whatever it is, the really good theories have an immense potential. It's incredible how strong they are. It's, really, it's, it's a miracle how strong they are. They may not be right in the end, but first of all, you have to understand what these theories are able to do. And they are extremely strong. That is really something you can see in the history of science. And you want to know what the real potential of a theory is before you give it up. So you better stick to a good theory as long as possible. And only give it up when it's absolutely unavoidable. Right? Only then and not earlier. Work with it as hard as you can. And only when it comes to the point where you say there is absolutely no way. The very best people in the world, in this area, have worked on it, and we can't see any way how to improve the theory. That was the situation, as I told you, in 19, from 1922 on with Bohr's model. That people said, look, we do not get any results any longer as hard as we can work as hard as we, as we want. It just doesn't give any more results. It's just over. And then people said, okay, let's give it up. Okay? But they worked very hard to get out the potential, and that is very important 
And this is what is exactly what the quasi-dogmatic element uh, of normal science um, delivers to the scientists. It says, stick to the theory and work with it. Come on, don't give up. There are always possibilities why something goes wrong. It's always possibilities why these 42 arc seconds cannot be explained. There are many, many possibilities why the theory can't do it. It's not important. We don't know what it is, but don't give up the theory because of that. It just doesn't make sense, right? And uh, here Darwin's uh, sex ratios is a, is a wonderful example for that. Uh, so it has often, that's what I said already, has often happened in the history of science that problems could eventually be solved in the existing research framework. And you can only get at that if you stick to the theory long enough. Right? What exactly long enough means is a difficult story again, because that's the question once you judge a, an anomaly as a, a significant anomaly. And that's a question of judgment again, for which again there is no strict criteria. But that is the point that is important here. Um, the further thing is, the longer you work with an anomaly that may become significant, for instance, this one here, because oh, that one here, that became a significant anomaly, if you work for a long time on a significant anomaly within the old framework, right, then you may get a deeper understanding of where exactly the failure of the old theory lies. Right? You must understand at what point exactly your old theory collapses and doesn't work any longer. Because the better you understand that failure of the old theory, the more hints you get what the new theory must accomplish. Right? So you better, the better you understand the failure, the better chances you have um, for the uh, invention of a new theory. This may prove extremely important for the invention of the alternative. Right? So that's the same in relationships. Right? Once you have a relationship and the relationship doesn't work for whatever reason, and uh, it's sometimes quite useful to understand what an idiot you are yourself, right? And you understand that why your partner thinks you are an idiot, because then you get the chance of improving yourself, right? And avoiding this mistake in your next relationship. So it's useful to understand what went wrong, right? That's very important. So why do people say after you have an air crash, right? Then why is it so important to say this uh, is what is not a crash, but with this engine of the A380, with this new uh, airplane from Airbus. Why do people analyze exactly what, what, what went wrong with this engine? Why? Very simple. Because understanding the mistake helps you to avoid it in the future. Right? That's exactly the same. So they are analyzing that every aircraft is analyzed to an unbelievable degree. Right? They fish out of the water when it was a water uh, air, air crash. They fish out all the parts of the airplane and, and put it together in, in huge uh, holes to put the whole airplane together again with all the remainders. Just to analyze exactly what the mistake was, what the, what, where, what the failure, what the source of the failure was. Because from the source of the failure, you always learn something for the improvement. And that's exactly the same in social relationships, you know, people being together. Uh, as in, in technology, and this is the same here. You must understand what goes wrong. And therefore, working on an, even a significant anomaly in the old framework reveals something about the weaknesses of the old framework from which you may learn, oh, that must be avoided in the new theory. And you only learn that if you do it in the framework of the old theory. So um, paradigm theory is very, very sophisticated in that respect. It's sophisticated in the sense that the quasi-dogmatic element brings people to exploiting, fully exploiting the potential of the old theory, but not only that, at the same time when you work in the, in the old framework on a significant anomaly, you get enough hints also for the new theory. So it, it's a double, it looks in both sides, it looks it looks in, in fully, fully realizing the potential of the old theory, and if the old theory has to be replaced by a new theory, you're getting hints of things that the new theory, of features of the new theory, by analyzing the mistakes of the old theory. So, and there, there you need some sort of a pressure to do so, and that's the quasi dogmatic element. The quasi dogmatic element simply tells you don't give up too early. Stick to the old theory. Usually it's your mistake. 
right? Not the theory's mistake. It's usually you mistake. You're too stupid. You choose the wrong problem, right? You, are, you don't have the ability to solve the stuff. It's your fault, not the theory's fault. And that's a very good strategy for these two reasons, both finding out, getting the full potential of the old theory and also getting hints at the new theory. And uh, you see immediately if you would give up, if you gave up uh, this principle of the quasi-dogmatic element, without it for the acceptance of theory, scientists would tend to jump from one theory to the next without ever knowing the real strength and the, the real weaknesses of the theory. If, if, as I said, if the guy in uh, 1871 would have said, oh, Darwinian theory can't explain the sex ratios, away with it, let's take something new. And he or she would have invented something else, and then after the first difficulty, say, oh, it doesn't solve this problem, get away with it. And they would jump from one theory, not explain, not really developing anything in any great detail and any depth. And the quasi-dogmatic element in paradigm theory just does that. Um, thus, the quasi-dogmatic element of normal science serves the aim of science, and it is reasonable. And that's the argument against the normative philosophies of science. So you develop out of the descriptive philosophy of science, you develop an argument to say that, to, to, to uh, uh, argue uh, for, for the unreasonableness of the normative philosophies of science about the continuous testing. And that was the aim um, of paradigm theory here. 